and then you just can press like on that. So how you click through? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cassandra Agmore. I'm one of the third year AM residents. Um, so I'll be presenting the EMCCM presentation today. I want to say a special thanks to Dr. Riggins, Lupin Barons, and also Dr. Beta, Kim, and Ms. Susan for your help. So AMS comes in with a patient um, who's a 74 year old um, male um, who has an active cell um, with a complaint of toothache for about six days. Um, the patient was started on amoxicillin ibuprofen by a dentist the day before and started experiencing facial swelling. According to EMS, um, the patient's um, airway was intact, um, all ABCs were intact, um, his vitals were, uh, were significant for attack part of 122, he was looking to kidney, but he was setting long in there at 98%. In route, they put in a peripheral IV. Um, they did an EKG, which showed no, normal signs rhythm with no extreme changes, and he was started on IV fluids and diphenhydramine for concerns for allergic reaction. Upon arrival, sorry, EZ, um, he was unable to speak. Uh, he had strider, but he had good air entry bilaterally. Uh, he was perfusing well, and um, he was somnolent, but he was um, following command. His vital signs were significant for tachycardia at 125. He was a kidney at 22. He was hypertensive, um, but a febrile and sat in long with 100%. Um, Fenustic was done, um, which is significant for a was of 500. So based on what you know so far, um, what are some of um, the preliminary problem lists? I heard Strider. Tachycardia. Yeah, tachycardia. Or glycemia. Right. Um, so on the pulmonary um, problem list consists of Strider, tongue swelling, altered mental status, and hyperglycemia. I'm also not going to mention tachycardia. So um, as far as initial interventions, um, is there anything that um, we would like to get done right away before getting any more history? I'm just going to call on someone here, um, Alex. Uh, potentially like epinephrine. <laughs> okay. Epinephrine was suggested as one. If we're thinking that it's a large reaction. Anything else? IVO2 monitor, airway cart. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sophia is like IVO2 monitor, um, airway cart, getting all that stuff ready. Yeah, Stephanie. What happened? Okay, um, Dr. Sin is saying a uh, tight set, getting that ready. And then Nick said page anesthesia for right. potential difficult airway. Um, and page anesthesia for potential difficult airway. Um, so in this particular case, um, where the airway is compromised, if the patient's spontaneously breathing, we have to ask ourselves, like, would we intubate right away? If we would intubate, would be our, um, um, some things that would get in the way of our intubation, uh, and whether or not um, we should get anesthesia um, since we know with these copying the airways, the single best attempt um, is usually suggested, um, since multiple uh, attempts could be um, could lead to adverse effects. So in this particular case, um, anesthesia was consulted right away via code 88. Um, ENT as well was also um, consulted at this time. Uh, you also want to think about, um, as far as the initial interventions, um, airway management is first and foremost, um, and that does not necessarily always mean to intubate the patient right away. Um, in this particular case, you can start the patient on two, not to the oxygen um, the oxygen them before um, intubation. Um, as well, you can start the patient on IV antibiotics for some sort of infection, which was done in this case. Um, the patient was started on Zosin. And you can also order a venous shock panel as well, being that the patient was hypoglycemic, um, if you wanted to look at like possibly like an anion gap or an infected bicarb, um, anything that would help you suggest like a hyperglycemic crisis. <laughs> as far as the HPI, the patient's history is pretty limited um, due to their inability to speak. Um, but we got a call from his wife. Um, so there's a 73 year old male with um, history of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. He hasn't been taking any of his medications for the past couple of weeks. 
Um, he's basically coming up with acute onset tongue swelling, neck swelling, and voice changed since last night. So he wasn't really altered, he just couldn't speak. Right. But alter, um, altered was um, basically what EMS said. Yeah. Um, so patient, um, he had a right upper toothache for the past couple of weeks, and he had a, a, went to the dentist who had started him on moxicillin and ibuprofen for treatment with a planned um, procedure later on to address the infection. Um, usually at his baseline, he is able to talk and swallow without difficulty. On review of systems, he was short of breath, he had dysphagia, um, also voice changes. As far as the current negatives, um, he had no um, recent history of fevers or chills, no variety of variety, like sy symptoms, no chest pain, no nausea, no vomiting, no myalgia, no dizziness, weakness, or headaches, according to his wife. On examination, he is somnolent, um, and he is in mild respiratory distress. Uh, he has a hoarse voice uh, when he's attempting to speak, uh, and he has bilateral swelling of the submandibular and submental regions. And his tongue is also elevated and sort of posterior with um, induration of the mouth. He had spider and he was also tachycardic. His abdomen was within normal limits. Um, he didn't have like any, he wasn't biophoretic and he had full range of motion with extremities. Uh, he was somnolent as we mentioned before, but he was arousable and he was able to follow commands. So as far as like the differential diagnosis, um, anything particular you'd be thinking of, I'm just going to call on Kathy. Or Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So Alexis um, mentioned Ludwig. Anything else? Harry, maybe anything else that you think of in addition to what makes? Okay, and is one as well. Okay. Okay, so we um, so basically differential diagnosis. Um, we're doing low weeks in China, angioedema, anaphylaxis that was mentioned as well, um, peritonsal abscess, um, also possibly nectaris and fasciitis. Um, and because he's hypoglycemic, we also throw in DKA and also HHS as well. On reassessment, he becomes a little bit less hypocardic at 101. He's still tachycardic, um, but he's a little bit less hypertensive this time. So a febrile now 95% on um, non -refeeder. At this time, anesthesia is already here in the ED. Um, and basically, the recommendation at this time is to, to the patient's level R for a fiber optic intubation. And I see you at the time also um, asked the ED team to activate a level one trauma code um, because they wanted trauma surgery at that side um, to accompany them to the OR uh, in case a surgical airway um, was. ENT also came down. ENT agreed with um, anesthesia's plan for OR for fiber optic intubation, and they also considered uh, <clears throat> the possibility of a chain as well. So now at this point, the venous shock panel was ordered earlier, came back. Um, so here's the venous blood gas. So Ali, do you mind um, walking us through like your interpretation of this blood gas? So sodium is within normal limits, potassium is low, elevated at 54, chloride is low at 94, the uh, bicarbonate don't have, don't have a uh, UN print, so seven. Glucose is pretty high at 946, so to calculate the anion gap is you know, 35 minus 94 plus 15, and you end up getting. It's increased there. Oh, yeah, 26. 26. Exactly. So, Ellie was copying the anion gap. Um, got it right. It's 26. Um, so, basically, um, he is acidotic uh, as well, and he has like a large anion gap of in addition, we have the type of glycemia as well at 946. Um, so that, that, that were mentioned was a bicarb 15.3. So if you're looking at all of the, um, the just the venous blood gas results, um, it's a little bit suspicious for possibility of TK or some kind of hyperglycemic crisis, um, which could sort of explain um, why EMS may have thought that he may have been altered. Um, it could have been more likely due to TKA, possibly. Um, not likely if he is altered at this time and the song is like, well, he has his song He's, um, his 
Ultimate tests more likely not due to respiratory failure, since at this time, even though his air was compromised, he is spontaneously breathing and he's able to maintain adequate ventilation oxygenation, which you can tell since he's not retaining CO2. He is retaining CO2. Come on, come on, please. No. No, no, no. What should this, okay. be, what should this be CO2 be? What did we teach you? For a pH of 7.2. 20. 20. Right, right. So he's retaining big time. After 42, right? So this is failure to have a respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis. Right. So he has a metabolic acidosis, a respiratory acidosis, and actually if you do the delta delta, it's a metabolic alkalosis. Right. Yeah, um, so as Dr. Sinner was uh, mentioning, um, he should be able to compensate more um, for the metabolic acidosis, so being that the peak ACO2 is 42, that's actually um, mean that he's not compensating well. Right, he has respiratory failure. Right. He needed to be intubated right away. So um, as far as like further testing consultations, is there anything else that anyone else would order at this point? Okay, we hear it beta hydroxy beta day. Um Alec and Dory, anything else? Right, C B C P P T. Yeah, like blood culture, chest X-ray. Right, cultures, um, as I mentioned. So um you order like C B C and P coax, type and spray, and also blood cultures, which were ordered at this time. So All the Right. Not me, but some. <laughs> um, so at this time, all the was consulted as well. So um, as far as like the blood test results, they come back. Um, basically, the CBC um, did not show any leukocytosis, um, but as far as his comp goes, it shows basically similar to what we saw with the um, BBG. Um, a little thing that's one thing that's a little bit worse on here is the anti gap is 30, and also he has like a gap is like 3 and then 2.28. OMFS comes in um, at this time to recommend the <laughs> CT soft tissue and neck, um, and they um, and they also are recommending like a tooth extraction in the OR decision and change. So the ED team at this time they ordered the chest x ray and CT soft tissue and neck. However, this was not completed at this time um, for SGO X um, since they wanted to um, secure their airway first in the form. So as far as the update upon the list, we have Ludwig's in China and we also have possibility. So just to go through a little bit, timeline, a patient came in around like 6.39. Um, he had latched on. Um, they were significant for possible hyperglycemic crisis. He was started on uh, Zosin at the time. Um, we could have possibly considered also adding fluids um, and also uh, starting an insulin drip, given the BG findings. Uh, the consoles were placed via code 88, um, and also one trauma was called ENT on the bus. Imaging was ordered, was not done, and the patient was sent to the floor. So as far as blood waves angina, um, it's basically the cellulitis of the submedibular space. Um, it's usually caused by more abscesses, more likely lower is more common than upper, and it can also be caused by piercings of retina. On presentations, the patients will have fever, dysphagia, we'll, we may even have some drooling as well, um, and you'll actually see the intervention of the sort of mouth, and the tongue will more likely be elevated and also sort of more prescriptive. Um, the golden standard for diagnosis is CT face and neck um, with IV contrast. Um, but as always, the treatment is always, you have to go through your ABC, so you have to uh, manage your airway first. Um, best thing to do is put the in the upright position uh, to decrease aspiration, and also you want to start IV antibiotics. And there have been several case studies that have talked about the possibility of using like steroids and nebulized epi, these kind of cases. Um, it's been shown to um, have, show reduced um, airway edema and improved intubation attempts. As far as like um, IV antibiotics for this kind of patient, um, usually with low vitamin angina, it's usually called microbial infection, um, including like staph, strep, um, fusibacterium, bacteroids, and actinomyces. So usually the antibiotics are used as penicillin plus metronidazole, um, or you can also use like penicillin and penicillin as well. If the patient's immunocompromised, like in the case of this patient with diabetes, um, you, you can go a little bit more broad and use pain with flagellum, or you can 
Williams Wilson, or even um, Mary Beth. So as far as the complications go, um, with the subdivisional space, if the infection gets pretty bad, it can go um, very posterior. Um, and as if you remember, behind um, from the subdivisional space, you have the retropharyngeal space. And if it goes behind the retro retropharyngeal space, we have the dangerous space. Um, dangerous space is the area where um, infections can trap um, from the oral space up to the base of the skull or even down to the spine. So one of the complications in, in this kind of patient is mediastinitis or meningitis and um, bronchitis as well. This position for these patients is usually to the OR or um, straight to the So today we'll be talking about like difficult airway, um, sort of differentiating anatomical versus physiological. Um, we'll talk about the indications of contraindications for fiber optic intubation, um, and also some of the general techniques and um, complications that applies. So according to the American Society of Anesthesiologists Task Force, um, they define the difficult airway as a kind of a situation where an anesthesiologist experiences difficulty with face mask ventilation, um, superbotic device placement, or um, tracheal intubation, or all three. Whereas with physiologically difficult airway, it's usually uh, when there's like physiological derangement that leads to increased risk of cardiovascular collapse and death during intubation. Uh, especially when the patient transitions from positive to positive pressure ventilation, which includes like the patient who's hypo hypoxemic, um, has already hypotensive before intubation, or has right ventricular failure. So with these kind of cases, you want to address these issues prior to intubation to sort of optimize the patient. So as far as in the ED, a difficult intubation um, occurs for us when a proper insertion of the tracheal tube um, with conventional uh, laryngoscope requires more than three attempts or more than 10 minutes. Um, despite the fact that the airway assessment is often um, constrained in the emergency situations and in ill patients, about 1% of emergency department intubations end up as, well, as failed airways, where the physician is unable to actually intubate the patient. So most of the time, we are able to secure the airway. Um, and the way to do that is by sort of predicting the digital airway. So there's different tools out there, one of them being lemon, which is a use a lemon score to basically determine which, which patient might pose an airway management difficulty. But before you even use a lemon score, you just want to use, when you're evaluating the area, you want to use your history, um, the HPI that you have, um, the physical exam all together, uh, just before even going to a lemon score. So you want to look at the patient's body habitus, like if they're obese or not, head neck anatomy, if they have like a short neck, or if they have a like looser prominent teeth. Um, or even like um, any like broken um, bones um, in the jaw, or even if they have like a beard as well. Things like that would make it more difficult to um, intubate or even um, get a tight seal on, um, yeah. So the lemon assessment, you look, first thing you do is look externally, um, which is like by looking at the patient, evaluate them, like I mentioned before, with like this looking at the cavities, the neck, um, the mouth as well. Then you want to evaluate the 332 rule, which is basically when you look at the patient and you see if they're able to fit three of their fingers between their incisors, which will tell you um, whether you have good access um, to the airway via like mouth opening. Um, you want to actually, you want to also use the, third, the second three is for three fingers to be used um, measurement, measurement, measurement between the mentum and the higher bone. Um, that's usually a good indication of some mandibular space and volume that's there. Um, and the last one is two, which is the distance from the high to the thyroid. Um, so that should be two finger um, width apart as well. And that's where it tells you how high is the larynx. Um, and if the length is pretty high, then it tells you that you might have issues with um, getting a good view. You can also use the model potty score, um, which is basically looking for adequate oral access. If you're able, if the patient fits between class one, class two, you're usually able to see the entire uvula, um, which means that you more likely to have adequate access, whereas if the patient has partial um, view, is, is a view is not there, then you it's um, technically moderate difficulty, and then if it's completely out of view, then it's um, high difficulty um, for class four. Then you want to look at obstruction. Um, there are different things that can cause obstruction, like neck cancer, or in this particular case, Lewis angina, neck hematoma, foreign bodies as well, or any form of like injury. And then you want to look at neck mobility as well. So um, basically, you usually want to be able to get the patient 
into like slight extension of the neck um, into the sniff position so you can um, optimize your view of the pharyngeal space. Um, usually this is more difficult in trauma patients who have seat collars on or patients who are elderly who have like arthritis or patients with Down syndrome um, who have atlantal axial instability. So as far as predicting the difficult airway, um, like any intubation can result in complications, um, but the best way to um, sort of predict, um, by predicting the difficult airway, you can anticipate like the difficult unique phase and you can decide whether or not you should use RSI or uh, think of other options. It's important to prepare for complications. Like I mentioned earlier, you want to have your right tray ready. Um, you want to um, get full fluid if you feel like you need anesthesia at bedside immediately. Um, and you, the other option you have is to perform an awake tracheal patient, um, which is actually the gold standard in airway management for predicted um, difficult airway, especially if the patient's spontaneously breathing. Um, as far as um, what we have accessible to us here um, in the ED, we do, uh, well, at Kings County, we have a disposable fiber optic light that can be used for awake intubations, whereas UHB, we only have like, a video um, or just a video. So as far as variable optic intubation, like I was mentioning before, you can use it for patients with limited neck mobility. You can use it for abnormal anatomy, facial trauma, um, and also like any sort of like airway. So as far as, far as prepping, you want to make sure number one is patient safety and comfort. Usually with um, these kind of intubations, patients are usually awake, so you want patient cooperation, um, and you want to walk them through what actually actually that happened. You want to have all your equipment ready, suction, and tell CO2. Um, and you also want to have whichever kind of um, uh, like fiber optic scope or video scope that you have built, or video on the you have built. As far as medications go, you want to use something to sort of decrease the mucus and to, um, to elevate secretions to allow um, the best view of <laughs> the airway space. Um, typically, glycopyrrolate is used. It usually has rapid onset, not much sedation and it helps with this. As far as like sedatives, you can use different types of sedatives and also anesthetics as well. So as far as like um, sedating the patient, typically in a weight intubation, you can use a combination of benzodiazepines and opioids to sort of sedate the patient. Um, typically in these cases, like I mentioned before, if the patient is spontaneously breathing um, or vent uh, ventilating, you do not want to, to further compromise the airway um, by starting it, right? Um, putting them under general anesthesia, which can lead to like inadequate ventilation, hypoxemia, and apnea. But in certain cases, this is required, um, especially in the case of children um, or non cooperative adults or patients with mental disabilities. So, some of the methods you can use, like I mentioned before, is like um, is uh, benzodiazepines. Midazolam is usually pretty good because it has a rapid onset, a uh, very short half life, and it also has some anterograde anesthesia. So the patients are going to um, some what happened during the uh, awake intubation. Um, some of the cons with that is that it, there's no allergies, so you usually have to combine it with a fluid. And um, there's um, Bailey um, back in 1990 showed that um, notice that 50% of patients that have uh, a combination of benzodiazepine with the opioid um, actually experience apnea during um, intubation. So as far as the analogies that you can use, um, morphine is commonly used because it leads to um, depressed airway reflexes. Um, but some of the cons that it, it is associated with hypertension and also bradycardia and respiratory depression, which um, leads to the alternative, which is fentanyl, which also has like rapid onset short half life and also depressed pharyngeal reflexes but has less histamine release, so it technically has less um, hypertension associated. Um, so sex um, is the alpha-2 adrenergic um, agonist, which has both analgesic and sensitive properties. So, and it does not, and in addition to that, it does not cause as much respiratory depression um, as um, some of the, the benzos and the opioids. So it's usually a good option. Um, so there's been like a lot of like small studies that have looked at it. Um, so right now, as of now, that appears to be the superior alternative for a sedation in these kind of patients. What about ketamine? You can also use ketamine. Um, ket um, Senator asked, Dr. Senator asked about ketamine. Um, ketamine is also another option as well. Um, but I, based on like the studies I was looking at, it seems like the preferred route is 
Just remember that ketamine side effect will bring a spasm, especially when you manipulate the airway. So I prefer not to use ketamine. So, um, Dr. Um, Silver mentioned that um, ketamine can lead to lower mental spasm, so um, usually it's not the best. It's not, it's not the best. Um, as far as like uh, anesthesia, um, you can give like topical anesthesia um, via like lidocaine, which you can, um, um, you can basically place the anesthesia, like basically place a uh, lidocaine around the nasal mucosa to cover the trigeminal nerve V1 and two, V2 um, to anesthetize the, where you're going to insert the scope. Um, <laughs> you can also use phenylephrine as well to allow for um, vasoconstriction, um, vasoconstriction to um, decrease the risk of epistaxis. And um, if you want to get further back into the, um, and cover um, and that's like the area for the tongue or pharynx and larynx. You usually have to cover V3, um, which you can do via um, the use of nebulized lidocaine. Another option is um, a transtracheal block, which is performed um, through the cricofibrin membrane. Um, it basically inside like the vagus nerve branches uh, and it um, and basically the epiglottis and the trachea. Yeah, you're good at actually. I'm just if you hover over, you can unmute it. Um, there's different approaches that you can use. You can um, either go through the nasal route or the oral route. Um, in particular, with this kind of patient, um, with our patient with the low in vagina, um, the oral route sort of out of is not really an option for us. So usually we want to go the nasal route. But there's certain contraindications for that. And one of the absolute contraindications is facial trauma. It's for like in this patient that you see here. Um, and if like there's mid face instability or severe bleeding as well, um, then fiber optic um, intubation is not really an option. Um, if the patient has like nasal foreign bodies or frequent epistaxis or nasal surgery, you can also consider not using um, uh, a nasal route as well. Um, and if the patient's completely un uncooperative. So the patient did survive. I know a lot of people might have that question. So that's kind of <laughs> Um, So as far as like general techniques go, um, you want to make sure you position the patient. If it's a weight intubation, the patient's going to be sitting upright. Um, you usually want to protrude the tongue so you can um, get us the best access to the airway. Um, you want to place the scope um, and tilt it about 45 degrees downward. Once you go past the base of the tongue, you want to go direct towards the glottic opening. Uh, and then you want to steer the scope into the vocal cords and then advance it to the level of the mitrachia. And then once you get there, you want to basically um, advance the ET tube. Um, and then you want to leave it about two, three centimeters above the spina. It's very important once you're done with that to, once you're removing the scope, you, there's always a higher risk of dislodgement of the tube. So you want to confirm the placement as always with Intel CO2 also and consultation. The fiber scope, which directs it towards a blind recess. When you reach the posterior nasal pharynx, ask the conscious patient to stick out her tongue. This maneuver makes it easier to advance the instrument towards the epiglottis. Simultaneously, Lift the tip of the flyboscope, making a slight downward movement with the thumb of the hand that is holding the instrument. If a patient is heavily sedated, a tongue traction maneuver is helpful. At the supraglottic region, introduce one to two milliliters of local anesthetic through the working channel of the flyboscope while administering oxygen to propel the anesthetic into the area. 
advance the fibrous coat posterior to the epiglottis and through the vocal cords, taking care to avoid any direct contact with the pharyngeal and laryngeal structures. You can facilitate the advancement through the glottis by making a slight downward movement with the tip of the Understanding the difference between the trachea with its rings and its posterior tracheal membrane and the esophagus is important because sometimes the scope is unintentionally advanced into the esophagus. Inject an additional 1 to 2 milliliters of local anesthetic through the channel of the fibrous cord. This stimulus will induce a cough reflex and disperse the local anesthetic within the trachea. Make sure the fibrous cord remains in the proximal part of the trachea as only this area is anesthetized. The introduction of local anesthetic within the trachea and the supralaryngeal region will improve patient comfort and render the procedure easier. Alternatively, you can introduce the anesthesia by direct injection via puncture of the cricothyroid membrane. This direct injection technique is reliable, time efficient, and easy to perform. To induce general anesthesia, we prefer etomidate 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram body weight in non critical care settings. Note that etomidate is not the drug of choice in critically ill patients because it may induce adrenal insufficiency. Thus, Another intravenous agent, such as midazolam or propofol, should be used in critically ill patients. The administration of a hypnotic before advancing the tube in patients without a severely compromised airway increases patient comfort and may also decrease the reluctance of anesthesiologists to perform fiber optic intubation in an awake patient. After the patient loses consciousness, advance the instrument towards the carina. If the patient has a severely compromised airway, do not give any sedating medication, even for the insertion of the fibers. Um, so basically, uh, with this technique, um, usually there is a, the first type, the first time attempt is there's a failure rate of about fifty three percent. So basically, in the study where they like a small study with forty five patients, um, when they underwent fiber optic intubation, it was fifty three percent rate of failure. But there was actually a high success rate once they made the necessary adjustments to get the tube actually in. Um, some of these necessary adjustments um, would be like if you notice in the first picture, um, the, the ET tube actually got stuck um, in some of the airway structures. And the second one was esophageal intubation. So, some of the things that you want to do is that you want to maneuver the ET tube by retracting um, the ET tube, turning it 90 degrees counterclockwise, um, and also re advancing. And usually with these techniques and you can usually, um, there's usually less than 1% um, chance of not being able to intubate the patient. Um, there is also, you have to also consider the ET tube size as well. So with this, um, the scope, you want to, the ET tube size that has the least amount of space between the scope and the ET tube. Um, the larger the space is, the higher the chance of it getting stuck um, in some of the airway structures. So um, the difficult um, airway society um, basically looked at different things that you can do to sort of um, troubleshoot if you're not able to get in the first time. You want to usually look at sedation, whether or not you use adequate sedation, um, make sure that the patient has adequate topical um, anesthesia as well, and then look at your O2 source, um, and also look at the different things that I mentioned before about adjusting the tube um, in order to... Um, get the subclinical intubation. Um, in addition to this, like one of the things that's really important is stimulation. Um, since we, um, usually the golden standard is fiber optic intubation for difficult airway, but it's really dependent on the person intubating and how quickly they feel with intubations. So usually it's best to, um, to practice and get more proficient with um, fiber optic intubation in a control environment, um, such as um, with the mannequin, um, and basically, once you're able to learn this, the steps that are necessary to do such intubation, you want to sort of inc incorporate into your routine airway management to um, increase proficiency. So, some of the complications that come with that is that um, since there's a risk of epistaxis, um, also like trauma of the airway, um, laryngeal spasm as well is another risk, and also um, aspiration. 
some of the more rare complications is gastric rupture, um, especially if you have esophageal inflammation, um, such as so emphysema, even more recent. So as far as this patient goes, um, so initially he um, went to the OR for fiber optic intubation. Um, he was intubated after one attempt in the left near. Um, after intubation, he returned, um, he went to straight to the SICU. Um, in the SICU, they had ordered beta hydroxybutyrate at this time, which was significant 3.95. Um, they had done the COVID swab in the uh, operating room, so they were concerned about doing it in the ED, given um, his compromised airway, and that came back next. While he was in the SICU at this time, he was starting on an insulin drip. Um, and um, after that, um, OMFS, OMFS had plans to take him back to the OR um, to, um, to treat the infection. But before doing that, they wanted a CAT scan. Try pressing play again on the bottom. <coughs> so if you look at the casting here, um, there's a lot of spaces where you see a lot of air, where there shouldn't be air, um, like the submental space, the middleer space, even back in the retrospective space as well. Um, so with blood angina, angina, um, like I mentioned before, um, this, this CAT scan was very significant for that. Um, the patient had inflammatory changes in the submental sub space, sublingual space, also bilateral submandibular spaces, and also parapharyngeally as well, <laughs> and even in the retropharyngeal space, which is right um, immediately anterior to the danger space that I was mentioning earlier. And this image here is like a repeat, sort of this, um, the face and the neck was all um, in one, um, sort of um, CT scan. But it's a little bit more obvious here when you see the air, like all the black area here, up in here, that should be there. Over here, over here, you'll see a track down into here. So um, they read the CT soft tissue neck as being um, having extensive subcutaneous eczema that you notice um, that tracked fairly into the spaces of the neck um, and even into the bilateral carotid spaces as well, <laughs> which was um, consistent with necrotizing fasciitis. This is the CT chest. Here. Um, it's hard to see, but there's like actual, um, there's actual like a small pneumomedia sinus as well, surrounding the trachea and the esophagus. So after um, going to CAT scan, um, the patient went to, o went to the OR with OMFS and also ENT. Um, the, there were two um, teeth that were extracted at the time, teeth number 17 and 31. As you mentioned before, his weapon mentioned upper toothache, but it was actually um, the lower um, teeth that were infected, um, which is more common with little wings. Um, it was a second molar and a, uh, a first molar. Um, in addition to that, um, in the OR, they noticed that there was intraoral and cervical abscesses. Um, they drained it and placed multiple pen rows um, in the OR, and they closed the deep layer. They left the superficial layers open, and the patient was starting on clindamycin. ENT was also there at the time they explored the neck, um, and they also um, placed the tracheotomy. CT, um, thoracic surgery was called um, because of the concern for pneumomedia sinus. Um, they were there at bedside just in case there were signs of pneumomedia sinus, but at the time they didn't. So um, after that, um, so now the patient, he was once in sick um, he was placed on vancomycin and clindamycin, 
initially, and then he switched over to Lilizid um, and also Maripenem. Um, like I mentioned before, he was on an insulin drip as well. The following day, a um, patient was found to be in septic shock. Um, he, had, he was hypotensive in the 80s. He was tachycardic um, in the low hundreds and also about 101. Um, at this time, they took him back to CT um, to do CT neck and CT chest, which showed uh, improvement in the inflammatory changes that were there initially. Um, following that, hospital day two, they took him back to the OR um, since he started on pressors um, for septic shock on hospital day one. Um, when he went back to the OR for, a, for another washout, um, he, um, he he improved um, and he was um, pressed to work discontinued at that time. On hospital day three, um, the, oral, the oral cultures that were done um, initially came back um, positive um, for um, beta hemolytic um, strep, and it's that also um, strep gradients as well, and also some very negative thoughts. Uh, he required, he came more accepted again, requiring um, the use of pressors or pressors were restarted as well, and he was taken back to the floor for another washout. By hospital day four, he was off pressors. He, um, he had no white count, um, and he was started on, he was sent for um, IV patients, um, and he was kept on the insulin drip, um, even though his NI got closed because um, he required large amounts of insulin to control to his hyperglycemia. On hospital day five, um, the patient went to the OR where they, um, after they noticed that, um, they took him back to the OR and they noticed that there was extension into the substernal plane. Um, they drained about 20 cc of prolons at that time. Um, they did another CT neck after that and chest, and it showed like it was all on the side. On hospital day six, he had no fevers, but he had to go back to OR for more washout. Um, and they saw like a recollection in the southern area. And he also required a lot of autism um, to him as well at that time. On hospital day seven, he went back to the OR for the sixth time. Um, for another washout, and at this time, insulin was, the insulin joke was discontinued um, since the patient had episode hypoglycemia that morning. On hospital day eight, they restarted him back on insulin, on the insulin drip, since he required large amounts of insulin, which told his hypoglycemia. And then on hospital day nine, he, um, he was febrile, um, he had a high white count of 17. Um, for ID recommendations, he was switched back to meropenem, and my insulin was also added but he did not require any pressure support at this time. Um, hospital day 10, he has a trending WBC count um, and CT neck and chest was repeated, which still showed like a right carotid space fluid but that was sort of um, persistent, um, nothing new or expanding. On hospital day 11, he was taking back to the OR for the seventh time and all the spaces were re-explored. Um, and then by hospital day 12, he had a downtrending WBC. At, at this time, they recommended G2 placement um, due to the long course of um, treatment that he need um, before he'll be able to tolerate PO. Uh, and then on day 14, he had right, he complained of right neck pain um, and showed um, a lot of signs of pressure. So they started to find very present. On hospital day 15, at this point, the patient's afebrile. Um, he's no more pressors. Um, he has no white count and he's on a trait collar. He's no longer on the front. Um, he was downgraded to the floors on hospital day 16. Um, speech pathology was, was seeing him as well as physical therapy, um, and he's pending discharge on hospital day 17. So as far as like some key take-home points is like management of the difficult airway is crucial in the vagina. Um, where we say ABCs, we have to do it. If airway, if there's issues compromised, we have to address it right away. But it does not necessarily mean intubation right away. Um, multiple intubation attempts. Um, or usually associated with high adverse events. Um, so if, if you're not skilled in um, the use of fiber optic innovation, then the best treatment is always to, um, is to go down the route where the single best innovation can um, be achieved, um, whether it be by calling um, anesthesia. Um, fiber optic innovation is a great tool for these patients, especially with um, difficult airways. Um, and awake innovation is the golden standard for any patient with difficult airway because you do not want to um, compromise um, or actually lose the airway if the patient's already spontaneously breathing. And you want to select the approach that's most appropriate for your patient. So in our patient here, um, you need like a nasal intubation um, instead of oral um, due to the locus angina. And then you'll also want to think about your backup plans for um, uh, including right, 
um, and just consider that if this patient, most patients are able to be intubated, um, usually fire for optic intubation. So if he's not able to, um, if you're not able to intubate the patient, then just consider that it'll probably be a very challenging um, surgical intubation as well.